Aloha everyone. Welcome back again to Kealakai the podcast. My name is Mutia and today I'm please just welcome Ann Springer and Scott Springer. Before we dive in deeper, can you just introduce yourself a little bit? Hey, I'm Ann Springer. I teach business management marketing. I've been here almost eight years. And I'm Scott Springer. I teach leadership and management courses in the business management program. All right, we're going to start off with the first question that we would like to bring up, probably about something that you struggled about when you were in college as an undergrad student. We definitely had financial problems as college students. So uh, we started off, we met at BYU-Idaho. It was still called Ricks College at the time, and it was a two-year institution. So we were pretty much poor college students our entire time there, single and poor. And then we transferred to Utah State, and then we were married and poor. Uh, anything you want to add to married and poor? I remember when we were first married, our rent of our first apartment was $475. And between you and I, we made $400. I today don't know how we actually paid the bills. Were you able to live with that? We somehow <laughs> <Not> well. <laughs> paid the bills. I don't know. But there was a lot of, of miracles that took place in there. But poor, that's an understatement. Was the financial conditions the same or even harder when you were married? I would say it was definitely harder as we got married. Um, I think rent was more expensive and you just have fewer people to split your expenses with um we had scholarships which helped but i think we still took out student loans in order to to survive while both of us wanted to finish at the same time that was an important goal to us so yeah so student loans sometimes um you know they get a bad rap but mm -hmm. i think it made it possible for us to afford for us to both finish school together. Otherwise, it would have really made it a long process for us to finish. And we both had scholarships, and we couldn't see how it was possible for one of us to take a break. Um, it just made a lot more sense to take out the loans. Mm -hmm. We were able to start our careers at the same time, and we started a family not long after we graduated. So it worked out well for us, but everybody's situation's different, right? Ed? To yet add to that, I would say one complexity of a married couple in college is you're taking two poor individuals and putting <laughs> two poor people together to make a poor couple. But now uh, we are used to as single people making our financial decisions by ourselves. And for the most part, they impact only us when we're single. But when we are married, we are now a partnership. And so now financial decisions need to be made together. And that's, that's not always easy because we come from different places. We have different perspectives, different opinions, different backgrounds and experiences. But now our futures and our present and our future are very much tied together. And so that's an added complexity to the finances of college students uh, when you, you take two single people and then they become married. Do you have any tips that probably students should do as they like manage their groceries? I can just keep adding to the story I just shared, which is <laughs> we quickly figured out when we were dating and then more serious and then got married that we had different eating habits and different shopping habits at the grocery store. In fact, one of the first times when we were still friends, but we were spending a lot of time together, we both went to the grocery store and filled up our carts at the grocery store. And I was so proud that I had finished before she did. And I rolled up there to the aisle to pay for my food. And I didn't have anything in there that was close to healthy. But I, <laughs> I, it was fast. It was microwavable. And I was cheap. And I was proud of myself. And then she comes up with her cart a few minutes later. And there's vegetables. It's healthy. It's clean. It's good for you. And I realized we have some conversations we need to have here. So I learned a lot about buying better groceries and buying uh, more, being more intelligent about what I bought in the grocery store because I was spending more than I needed to on certain things. And she's definitely taught me early on how to make better buying decisions. Yeah, I would just add, it was kind of funny because he was so sure that his bill was going to be so much cheaper than mine. And I think it's a good reminder that processed food, 
even sometimes the cheap processed food, still it costs you just the same as buying whole food. Mm -hmm. And then it costs you your life in the end, right? So like an investment, students are always asking like, how do I invest in my future now? And I'd say investing in your health is a really good way to invest in your future. So when you're healthy in your 20s and 30s, like it pays you down the road right? You have more energy. You're not, you don't have to take as many sick days. You can enjoy your life. So it's like definitely an undervalued thing to invest in your health as part of your future. Yeah. So does that mean you cook a lot when you're in college? Yeah. So that's, yeah, definitely. And I think like, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't very expensive. So you like, you go to the, you go to Costco and like eggs, like you can get a ton of eggs for not a lot of money. You can get a ton of carrots for not a lot of money. Um, onions, celery, like a big bag of beans, a big bag of rice. Like those aren't things that are going to break anyone's budget, right? But it takes time. So you have to like meal plan and make, mm-hmm. you know, learn how to cook. That's another thing. Like a lot of people don't know how to cook. So, um, you know, we have TikTok. <laughs> yeah, if you can't figure thing. out how to cook on TikTok, you're in trouble, right? Like, yeah. yeah, there's so many resources. Yeah, lots of info out there to learn how to cook on a budget. So especially right now, your finances like are really dictated a lot by like your extra spending. You have what you, you call like your fixed expenses, like rent and things like that, that you can't really control. And then you have variable expenses, which is like your food and your fun. So we're lucky here because your fun is mostly free. So I think really focusing on, you know, those variable expenses, it's not the most fun sometimes, but those are the things you can control. So eating out, you know, the whole idea, we have food at home. (laughs) It's not very fun sometimes, but um, yeah, it's healthier. You save money. It's definitely probably like the area that has helped us, I think, financially the most is it's an area where you, you don't have to like waste a lot of money when you're throwing food away. You're wasting money, right? So we just, we don't have a lot of waste yeah, this guy eats leftovers like there's nobody's business. That helps a lot. You got to love leftovers if you want to get ahead financially, for sure. It does help. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this was the first moment I have saving for my family. When was it? <laughs> it was pretty late in marriage, actually. I don't know. So we went from like being poor college students to poor newlyweds to like a we had two little kids pretty fast right out of college. And, you know, that's expensive. I can't explain why, but it just really is. And then we just really were so used to being broke. And it was funny because all of a sudden we started really making money and we had money like stockpiling. I was like, oh, I don't even know. Like, what do you do now? Right. Now things more excited. It was exciting, but it was also pretty terrifying because, um, then you don't want to do the wrong thing, right? You don't know really, like, do we buy a house? Do we buy a car? And you kind of need everything when you've been depriving yourself for years, right? So do we go on vacation? It took a couple of years for us into our careers before we started feeling more financially stable. I don't know if our experience is typical of other couples, but I think I had the false idea that when I graduated from college and that we would have our first full-time jobs that somehow our financial difficulties were over. When that wasn't true, we were still struggling and we still had to manage very closely. It was a, it was a couple of years. It was, uh, into our second jobs after college that finally, as Anne was mentioning, we started to, to really gain some traction and start to move forward financially. But I don't know if that's typical, but that was true for us. Do you have any suggestion about how much we need to save up from our paycheck? I think if you're a college student, you have leftover money. That's amazing, first of all. <laughs> like I said, we were scraping to get by. Um, but if you if you can save, that's pretty spectacular. Um, and I think it's smart to have a plan. Like, what do you want to do? If you know your why 
behind what you want to do with your money, I think it's really helpful. So what do you want to do when you have extra money? And it's helpful to figure that out while you're still a poor college student, right? Because once you start making money, it's hard to know where you want to allocate those resources, right? right? And we do really want to multiply our money if we can. Uh, did you have a passive income or anything? Not in college. Not in college. Not in college. But passive income is a great idea. So anyone who can set up a passive income where something is making money, where we're not actively working on it, that's a definition of passive income. That's a great idea, no matter where we're at in our careers, just starting out or much later in our careers. So have you had an experience like that, probably like after college life? And if people want to start up with that. Yeah. So, I mean, this is going to be a really boring answer. It's sort <laughs> of like eating your vegetables, but it's a really honest, good answer, which is the best passive income, in my opinion, is investing in your 401k. So your if your company has a 401k option, it's really helpful because that money is making money while you're sleeping, right? That's the best kind of passive income. And it makes money over time. And that's what you want to see. So it's not the most fun, like I said, because it's like, oh, yeah, I'll have money when I'm old, right? right? Well, here we are, we're getting older. So it's, it is exciting. And I'm very grateful that we invested when we were young, right? Mm-hmm. And we were poor college students, and we were poor newlyweds. And um, we didn't have a lot of extra money. And it felt like a sacrifice to put that money away. Yeah. But over time, it really does um, good things for you. Other than that, I'd say I always encourage my students, like marketers, have a side gig. People are always going to want help with their business. They're going to ask you for help. So we had a side gig for many years, and um, that helped fund our first house. Uh, It's helped with lots of other things. Helps you professionally, I feel like, as well. So anything you'd want to add? Real estate side gig is also good, right? When you have it's really good because it's gonna increase all the time. Yeah. So, but some of those things take time, right? Like it's not gonna happen, right? Like any student that's doing that right now, kudos to you. That's awesome. But a lot of that, I think, comes with time. I'm a big fan of side gigs or some other second or third option for making money. For example, in my career, I worked in publishing for a Uh long time. That's what I studied in college, and that's what I worked in for a couple of decades. But several years into my career, I decided I would start teaching college part-time. I earned my master's degree and decided to explore teaching university courses. And that became a part-time job. It also is now my full-time job. So in that case, I realized over teaching after a number of years that I was actually more passionate about my part-time job than I was about my full-time job. Uh And so I actually switched my careers, but I never would have known that if I hadn't actually explored another source of income, which then actually became a career change later on. We have a lot of international students here, or even people who are local here. They are working part-time at the Polynesian Cultural Center or on campus. Do you think that's a good start for them? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's so many great campus jobs that can really help you build your resume. Resume, um, Like, for example, almost every campus department has an accounting mm-hmm. position for a student accountant. I know they're like I counted. There's like over 100 jobs that are considered marketing jobs between here and PCC. So, yeah, totally start getting work experience now. Okay. Um, do you have anything or a suggestion about how we should track our money? That's a great question. So I love a good old-fashioned spreadsheet. Um, the spreadsheet? Yeah. Do you do it in Google? Yes. So we've we had a shared we Google still do have one. shared Google sheet for a long time. Um that's just really simple. Like it doesn't have to be like, there's all these apps and you can pay for things. I'm kind of anti a lot of those apps and I'll tell you why. So they link to like your bank account. So it's super convenient, but you also like 
you're giving up a lot of personal information. I'm always a little cautious about that. Um, right. Yeah. From a marketing perspective, like I see the benefit <laughs> for the company, but like I see a lot of downside for an individual. So um, we just enter a lot of our expenses monthly into a shared uh, Google Sheet. You don't have to do it for months and months, but you can do it for like three months or six months and just to see where your money's going and it holds you accountable. And then after a while, it gets pretty boring. I don't know. We're, I think we're boring spenders like Costco, gas, Taco Bell. <laughs> like, I don't know. We don't do that many interesting things. So, um, you start to, but it gives you an idea of like, oh, we spend a lot at Foodland, like, right? That's a scary place to go into, right? Because <laughs> there goes 40 bucks and you get like two things. So um, tracking that for a while, it helped us see like, oh, maybe less spontaneous trips to Foodland or, you know. Right. I would add to these about budgeting two things. Number one is for those who say budgeting is impossible or is not something they want to do, I would I would argue what's the purpose in budgeting? What are you trying to learn? So is is it to inventory what you're spending money on? That's one purpose. Is it to identify areas in which to save more money? That's a different purpose. Is it to find a way to share expenses across two people and find out who's spending more than the other person? Another purpose. But to really identify why am I budgeting? What, what question am I trying to answer with this? And the second thing I would say about budgeting is Set a specific time frame around it. We're going to track our expenses for 30 days because feeling like, oh, I can't start a budget. That's just, that's, it's like this future. I'm never going to keep track of this. I, this is a never ending task, but what's the purpose of it? And just focus on that and track it for 30 days. We can all do something for 30 days, track it for 30 days. And then at the end of that, we decide, do we need to keep the budget? Okay, keep it. If we don't, maybe we learn what we've learned and we, we don't have to do it anymore. But either way, budgeting doesn't have to be something we do constantly. It can be more focused and purpose driven. A student asked me a question. He asked, well, how do I stick to a budget, right? It's hard. He's like, I made a budget, but I'm not sticking very well to it. You want to hang out with friends too. <laughs> that needs money. Yeah. So I think part of it is understanding your why. Why do you want to have the budget? And then why do we even have money? Like, what is the purpose of money in our life? And understanding like it's to reach our goals, right? Like it's to help us to be self-sufficient. And what is, what is your goal? Maybe part of your goal is to socialize, right? So it's one thing to go out with friends and spend money on food. And it's another to say, oh, I just don't feel like eating this thing that I meal prepped because now it doesn't, right. now I'd rather eat whatever thing, right? But if you're just spending money in isolation and for convenience, that's very different than like, oh, I'm doing this because I'm part of like this social setting and I want to participate and have friends. Do you see the difference? Right. And right. so it's like money gives you choices that I always tell people. So it, when you have the opportunity to have funds, it gives you it gives you those different variety of choices as opposed to like when you don't have money all of a sudden your choices are very limited. Like now it's not even an option of do I want to go with friends or do I want to eat this because it's convenient or, you know, do I want to buy this car or that car? All of a sudden you don't, you don't have an option, right? When you don't have money, your, your option is no all the time, right? right? And so I think sometimes people miss the point too, because you should be able to go out and have fun. Like mm -hmm. that is a choice you can make, right? Like, um, we're fortunate now, you know, we're getting close to empty nester stage. <laughs> and so it's like everything in the past has been about like, oh, we have to save for this or kids need this. Or now we're like, oh, we could do that because we can. Right. And so it's kind of it's more fun that way. It's nice to, again, have choices. But sometimes, you know, you're in a different stage of life and it doesn't meet your goals. So you have to look at like, what is the goal? Yeah. What's my why? It makes me think money is not everything, mm -hmm. but everything needs money. So mm -hmm. we need budgeting. Yeah. One last question. I know that everything is not always goes up, especially with our financial condition. Uh, sometimes we do have problem too. But how do we find peace when mm -hmm. we have that kind of problem? Good question. So I feel like, you know, like the tide here goes in and it goes out. 
money is kind of like that. And r- everything in our becomes life. so sensitive. <laughs> yeah. And when the tide is high, the ocean doesn't feel very friendly. Yeah, it is yeah. not. Yeah. You can cry all the time because of that. <laughs> yeah. I guess I just would say, like, hang in there because um, money comes and goes in your life, right? And it's, it's not the most important thing. Like I said, it gives you choices. It gives you more agency. Um, but things always are, you know, you pay your tithing. You work hard. It always works out. And um, even in the most dire circumstances sometimes that we've had, it always seems to work out. Do you want to add anything? I was going to add something about tithing. I've always appreciated that tithing is a commandment with a specific promise that the Lord says, challenge me. You know, prove me now herewith, he says, if I will not open up the windows of heaven. I can't think of any other commandment where the Lord says, prove me. Prove to me that if you follow this, I will bless you. But in that case, and I have a testimony of tithing that even in the poorest of days or the days when we've had more money to spend, we've always been faithful paying our tithing. And I've always known to your question about peace, I've always had that peace come that the Lord is guiding. The Lord is watching over it. Uh, he, He won't give us all of our wants, but he'll help us with our needs. And that is what I understand to be opening up the windows of heaven. That's amazing. I really testify that is true because I remember we had a lot of struggle in the mission, probably like about financial, about paying things too, Mm -hmm. and like keeping things for ourselves and make it more like valuable. Sometimes we just don't remember that actually everything comes from God. And especially when we don't have anything that we need, uh, probably it's our time to learn to to wait a little longer for bigger blessings but at the same time i do know that god is always watches over us sometimes we just need to try harder well for the last thing before we close up do you have any word of wisdom that you would like the listener to to hear i will share one thing i'm asked frequently as a professor for advice about career choices students wanting to do this or wanting to go this direction or maybe a, what should I do about graduate school these are all great questions wonderful very personal questions one thing I always advise is whatever career choice we do pursue let money not be the driving reason that we're pursuing it because money is important we need money to support ourselves and our families but there has to be more to it than just This is a high paying job. We put a lot of our life and our soul into our careers. And so choose something that allows us to support our life and our family, but is something that we can do really well, that we're passionate about, and that we feel like we're serving society and we're serving the Lord. Awesome. And do you have anything to add to that? Um, I would add that... I think it's really important for both spouses to have equal say in how the finances are handled. Um, We've taken turns at different times being like the main overseer because it's really hard to like sit like side by side and do it together. Like I think that's how it's kind of imagined. But the reality is that you really can't do that, especially when you have little kids. It usually becomes one person's job more than another. Um, So we've taken turns, just whoever has more availability to do it. But we've both always had equal say in how the money is divided. Even at times when, you know, one of us was working full time and the other wasn't, it always felt like it was both of our money. We were both contributing, even if one wasn't earning a wage because one was at home with the kids more. Um, And I think that can get out of balance. And I've seen it be a really negative topic for couples that can cause a lot of division in marriage. So I would say just always be aware of like the financial divide that can occur. um, Even when maybe the division of labor at home is different. I mean, that kind of ebbs and flows like the tide too. And um, it shouldn't dictate how 
those decisions are made. It should definitely be made in unison, even if, again, you're not sitting side by side over a spreadsheet and literally writing the bills out together. Like It doesn't <laughs> even look like that in today's world anymore. There's no writing out bills. Everything's done electronically for the most part. But um, I think it's just really important to have, again, that why needs to be the same. Um, and when you're unified in that, it just all really flows together. But if if there's not unity in that and there's not equity in that, then I think it, it can really cause a lot of problems. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for giving us a lot of suggestions. I hope this will be so useful for all the listeners, especially actually this is useful for me too as a student. Good. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for coming. And for all the listeners, remember to remember to, to ask yourself about your why you are doing budgeting and all of the things that we have discussed today. And we would like to hear more of your stories. If you guys have something that you would like to share with us, uh, just follow us at Kaila Kai News and we would like to feature with you. Anyway, have a good time. Thank you. Thanks.